welcome to Reconciliation Road, an exciting new podcast hosted by yours truly, Dan George. Here on Reconciliation Road, we seek to build bridges of better understanding with the hopes of creating a markedly different future for our children and grandchildren than the often painful memories of our elders. I believe we all have a role to play in this journey we call reconciliation, and I seek to understand and celebrate the good work being done right now with the game changers, trailblazers, and movers and shakers. Reconciliation, as we know, is a journey, not a destination. The road to reconciliation is a long and winding one with many stops along the way. When we come together, great things happen, and I thank you for joining me on this journey. I extend appreciation, uh, as always, to the First Nation Major Projects Coalition, who sponsor, in part, this podcast. And my guest for our third episode is none other than Chief Charlene Gale. Good afternoon, uh, Chief Gale. Uh, Chief Gale has been an elected councillor of the Fort Nelson First Nation since 2009. She is an active Indigenous leader and member of the Fort Nelson First Nation and envisions a future where all members are working together to become a strong, proud, healthy and self-reliant nation. Chief Gale enjoys being on the land with her family, exploring the territory and teaching her son the traditional ways on how to hunt, fish and gather medicines and berries during the seasonal rounds. As a leader and chief of the nation, she understands the importance of upholding the spirit and intent of the treaty by asserting her people's rights to their land and taking responsibility for ensuring that our future generations are able to live their lives in their territory in a way that honors our ancestors. Charlene started her career in oil and gas working at the Fort Nelson gas plant in 1999, and she is currently on leave while she leads her nation. Her various roles working in administration, finance, maintenance, planning, and in leadership have given her extensive experience in the oil and gas sector, the corporate world, and the vision to ensure our people are managing our lands and our resources in our territory to the benefit of our members. Chief Gale is the chair of the Daytai Corporation, the nation's economic arm to prosperity. Her people are looking at ways in which their economic development holdings can be diversified. This diversification is being pursued through a major geothermal electricity project and a partnership with Peak Renewals to diversify the forest industry in their territory. Dedication to public service has always been a value of importance to Chief Gale, and in 2020, as the COVID-19 pandemic hit Canada, she was asked by Premier Horgan to serve on the BC Government Economic Recovery Task Force. As the only Indigenous leader named to the task force, this opportunity has her serving alongside other leaders of BC's business community, providing guidance and advice to the Premier and senior officials within the BC government concerning the economic recovery of the province during these unprecedented times. Her experience in public service as a professional working in the energy sector and as an Indigenous community leader has provided her with a broad range of perspectives, knowledge and depth on the interplay between Indigenous peoples and the energy sector in Canada. And I've had the opportunity to uh, watch you in action, uh, Chief Gale, applying all of those skills uh, that you have gained uh, over your lifetime of service to your people. Uh, Charlene is also the chair of the First Nations Major Projects Coalition and believes that First Nations need to have the opportunity to have equity in major project infrastructure and access to meaningful financing for these projects happening in their territories. One that focuses on a balanced approach of economic prosperity alongside of environmental stewardship. Several First Nations have formed the First Nations Major Projects Coalition for the purpose of examining how ownership of major resource projects on their lands can be facilitated and how environmental practices can be improved to meet their needs. The work of the Major Projects Coalition is directed through feedback received from the First Nations participating in the coalition. Um, I've been fortunate to have a, uh, an interesting uh, viewpoint uh, for the coalition uh, participating and providing uh, strategic facilitation uh, for the group. And uh, really, uh, Chief Gale, I'm excited to have you here on our program today. I've witnessed the phenomenal growth that the Major Projects Coalition has gone through under your leadership, as well as um, you know the really um, important activities that you undertake in your home territory on behalf of your people, uh, on behalf of uh, your elders. So good, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for joining me, um, Charlene. Good day, Dan. Um, Thanks. Excellent, excellent to have you here. Um, and um, I'm really happy that um, you're one of the first people that I'm speaking to at the commencement of Reconciliation Road um, for a number of reasons. And I think one of them 
the primary uh, reason is your overarching leadership style and how you are able to bring people together to coalesce and gel around different ideas and move together in a collaborative fashion. And the, fa and the fact that's really important to me is that um, you're an Indigenous woman and you're providing that leadership um, for our organizations, for your community, and uh, we well know the leadership that is provided uh, by women um, within our within our family. So uh, I raise my hands in respect to you, um, Chief Gale, for for all that you do. And you know, there's a lot of different projects that you're working on um, on behalf of your people. And I just want to just kind of throw the door wide open for you, uh, Charlene. Other, what do you want to share? Some of the projects that you're working on, so that our audience has a little bit of an idea of what it's like to be Chief Gale for a day. Okay, well, thank you, Dan. I just want to acknowledge that I am speaking from the unceded Treaty 8 territory within the traditional lands of the Fort Nelson First Nation. We are a strong, healthy, proud, self-reliant Cree and Dene people, and our ancestors have taught us to be resilient, innovative, and to work hard for future generations. We have been here for thousands of years. Our connection with the land and resources of our territories goes back many generations. And our members understand the importance of upholding the spirit intent of the treaty. Um, a lot of uh, the promises have been forgotten. And I would like to get a little bit into that discussion a little later when um, we're done talking about some of the projects we're currently working on as a nation. Uh, very, very honored to be here um, serving as the Fort Nelson First Nation Chief, but also in my role as capacity as the Chair of the First Nation Major Projects Coalition, and also the Chair of the Daytai Corporation, in which uh, the nation has worked very hard over the last couple of years to really form our own economic development arm, so we could separate the businesses, business from the politics and really focus on building up our community. Uh, having own source revenue is really important to our people because the money we get from the federal government doesn't even meet the needs of our community. So we find ourselves um, every budget year really putting forward nation funds to be able to provide the services that our community really needs. So that's why these economic development projects are so important to our people and to the people within the local um, municipality that live in our territory. One of the projects that we're currently working on is the Clark Lake Geothermal Project, which is pretty much harnessing heat from the earth to produce electricity in a re new revolutionary way um, in the north. This is a new path for our people, and it's going to be able to enhance our ability into the future, especially being a green energy um, nation that's leading the way. Um, I definitely feel that um, we are not going to be left behind in this new um, way of moving forward to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We um, have spent a considerable amount of time engaging with our, our community and talking about what um, we envision for our future economic sustainability, um, for our environmental stewardship, and the health and wellness of our nation and our people. And also like talking with our elders because they constantly remind us that our future is directly tied to the land and that sustaining future generation depends on how we manage that land and our resources today. So that is really always on the forefront of our minds and how we are going to ensure that seven generations ahead are going to have what we have today when it comes to um, you know fresh air, fresh water, um, all those things that are very important to us as Dene and Cree people. So just getting into the Clark Lake Geothermal Project, it's a very exciting time for our community. Um, you know, the reservoir is being um, captured by repurposing an old gas well, which is the first uh, BC geothermal plant in, uh, in in BC and, and let alone Canada as in being the first Indigenous owned. So we have um, over time um, seen the Clark Lake gas reservoir in our community for over 50 years. And during that time, it was so um, neat to hear and see a lot of people from the past that worked along that, that line and along that area. Um, when the gas would come out, they said the pipeline um, 
obviously what was coming out of there was really hot because the pipeline wouldn't have any snow on it, but there would be four feet of snow around it. So we have, uh, we have high hopes that the temperatures are what they need to be. And we recently just went for uh, a tour of the facility with our board of directors and our council and some of the industry players that are looking at purchasing some of this heat for some of the projects they want to um, create in the area. So I literally had shivers going up my arms for the fact that this is coming to reality when you see a big drill site ready to go and to put into action and you know a crew is going to be coming next week. It just, uh, it just was such a remarkable feeling because, um, you know, we didn't have this opportunity when oil and gas was here to be right at the forefront, making these decisions on the ground, making this project successful. Um, you know, with this geothermal project, it's ours and we get to invite people in to share our story and just to talk about how we can put a project forward that's sustainable, that's clean and profitable for, for our nation. And also um, with Daytai Corporation, like it's just an exciting time for our economic arm and our board of directors to really work with our community and under other governments and industry players to make this project a success. So um, we're excited. Wow, that's uh, a lot going on there. And I, I want to speak a little bit about the Clark Lake geothermal project, because that's one of the big projects that you have in your in. Uh, in your arsenal, it's not the only project. You have many, many other projects that are underway up in your area. But before I talk a little bit about a couple of comments and questions about the Clark Lake Geothermal Project, you mentioned the treaty and uh, you are a treaty people. And why is, why is that important that our audience understand uh, that you're treaty and, and, and why should they care about that? Yes, um, treaty is very, very important. I believe that, um, you know, we have seen treaty be signed um, in the early 1900s, you know, I think it's really important for people to really understand that we're all treaty people and we need to find ways to come together to ensure that the treaty promises are honored. Um, I see time and time again where, you know, communities are um, working with a local government to ensure that those, prom those treaty promises are honored and at times you see other um, influences from people living in the territory that don't agree or don't understand. So I think it's important that um, people really understand what treaty is. And you know when so when you think of of these promises um, and the settlements that need to be filled, um, they're some of them are a hundred years old. So when, when the government is coming to settle an agreement or a promise with the nation, I think that other Canadians and people living in the territory around those First Nations that are going through this need to think generously about this. And remember that you are, you are treaty people too. Um, these promises need to be honored. Talk to your neighbors um, who have made have forgotten that uh, you, know, you are a treaty person. Um, you shouldn't be opposing First Nations being a part of their economy. You shouldn't be opposing First Nations managing their land or resources or protecting their territories or working towards a sustainable future for their people and their way of life. Um, I just ask that people really remember that they are treaty people too. And the reason for treaty was to ensure that we opened up our lands in peace and sharing. So it gave the, the settlers an opportunity to prosper also. And, you know, as we move into modern day, we need to be a part of that. We want the same things that you want. We want to have good lives for our families, good lives for our communities. We want to build them up and we want to support each other. So I think the more that um, Canadians look at what treaty really means and how they're a part of that, it um, can really open the the discussion for more positive outlook, um, maybe a more positive um, response of like, you know, some of the things that you may have thought, you might be able to wrap your, your mind around it a little bit more, but it's just like a hard truth to acknowledge at sometimes because the reality is, is that the promises of treaties are what opened up our land to share with the settlers so that the settlers could prosper in our lands 
And this is true in my territory, and it's also true across Turtle Island as well. Thank you very much uh, for that. And um, I really, what's important, I believe, for all British Columbians and all Canadians is for us to do our own homework and for us to be able to educate um, ourselves. Mm -hmm. And um, I look um, to the recent um, occurrence uh, the Kamloops Indian Residential School here where um, 215 uh, lost souls were identified um, in unmarked graves and what that has meant to um, the re-victimization, the re-traumatization of our people who were subjected to uh, to residential schools and um, you know the um, the residue of the Indian Act but it's also a real opportunity for people to get educated um, and to seek out the information that they require to make um, learned decisions and to form, uh, um, you know, good opinions about uh, about matters. And you know, I'm I'm finding that um, there's uh, appears to be, and I, and I just want, I want to see if, if it's the same for you from your perspective, Chief. There appears to be more of a willingness now um, for people to learn. And I think that um, what has happened here in Kamloops has shocked everybody um, as it should um, how can we use this situation to um, improve relations because you know when when I when I watch you talk and when I'm in your presence you've got such good energy and you're always so positive and you're always trying to find the, the ways to to work together what advice do you have for people out there who um, you know who, who might not know because they just don't know they were never taught or there might be some of a memory of convenience um, as well, right? But what what can we take away from this um, tragic situation that happened in Kamloops? And you know, how do you use it to empower yourself to do the work that you do day in and day out, Chief? We just really gotta sit down and actually think about what that announcement. It's 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 a really hard topic to talk about because um, with that announcement, it really opened up a lot of um, hurt and emotions within our community. And it only didn't just happen to the survivors, it happened to the intergenerational um, members that you know have gone through this alongside watching their grandparents or their parents grow up. I think this is a really good opportunity for all of us to just um, sit down and really think about what had happened here. I think that it also um, allowed the opportunity for, for non-Indigenous people to think about what would they do if that was happening to them right now with their three-year-old baby or their six-year-old, or you know, they're, they're watching their kids go to the university and think they would have never had that opportunity if they were Indigenous. I think it really opens up a perspective of understanding why Indigenous people are the way they are. Um, you know, we have a lot to share with people and we're always open and we're always wanting to share our culture and our language and our identity with people. And I don't think that will ever change. It's just the willingness of the non-Indigenous community to be able to um, join us in that celebration of who we are. Um, you know, we have a lot of uh, diverseness within our own communities and a lot of culture that we celebrate. Um, you know, I just think that it now is the time for all of us to come together in unity. And I don't expect us to agree 100% on everything, but, you know, we all need to agree to be role models and to just um, really role model what we expect in the future. How can we work together? We need to try to understand each other, um, you know, accommodate each other when we can and respect our differences when we can't. I think we need to do um, a lot of work in that regard and find the middle ground. This is what's going to form a relationship going forward with Indigenous people and other Canadians, um, Indigenous people with governments, Indigenous people with industry. I think that overall, when we come together in unity, that we all look forward to a future that is a, the betterment of our families, the betterment of our communities, and the betterment of our own country. So I think now is the time to work together. Thank you, Chief. And, you know, like you, I believe that um, together um, we are stronger. And, and I believe that um, there's not an, 
enough of us to throw anyone away. Like everyone is required in this very important work that we need to do moving forward. And the best way to honor those um, those lost souls is for us to do a better job of, um, of collaborating with one another, uh, do a better job of um, creating safe space for us to be able to have the differences um, because differences aren't all bad, right? Um, um, conflicts used in a healthy way can, can uh, move your agenda forward. And um, I wanted to, um, to tie it back to the very exciting Clark Lake geothermal uh, project. And you know, um, as you outlined, the facility will provide uh, clean renewable energy and displace gas fired uh, generation, which the region is 100% dependent on right now. Mm -hmm. And it will also generate employment for the region, boost the economy for Fort Nelson, and produce a positive long-term revenue stream for the nations and the region. And I think that what some people um, fail to um, remember is that when our communities are firing on our economic cylinders and we are contributing in the economy, that um, we raise up um, the surrounding towns uh, around our territories like a you know, um, um, a rising tide floats all boats, right? So what is gonna be some of the economic impact outside of uh, your community to the region up there from the Clark Lake Geothermal Project? Well, the Clark Lake Geothermal Project is a real opportunity also for our youth. We want to be able to uphold our youth and grow their confidence in leaders towards stewardship of our territory, whether that's the guardianship program, they want to get into environmental, they want to be a part of the, the um, geothermal project, or any of the other projects that we currently have on the go as a nation. But I believe that this innovative and cutting edge project is obviously a first of its kind. Uh, we're going to learn a lot. We're going to share that information with other Canadians. And, you know, we really want to inspire our youth to start looking and looking at careers in regards to this, because I think that um, the more opportunity we can provide to them here locally in, in our territory, the less they'll be moving away um, and educating themselves and um, not coming back. So we really want to keep our youth here and our members and give them that opportunity. Um, just the other day, we brought the high school students over to the Clark Lake field. Um, they got to see the rig. Um, we got a couple um, apprenticeships going on so that uh, you know some people can be involved from the right at the beginning of the project to the end with the drilling process. Um, we're working with the Northern Lights College to ensure that um, some of the training will be here. Um, working, up, working with the University of Alberta and uh, a couple other universities just to bring that expertise of academics here, um, looking at setting up a, a university lab right in the Fort Nelson area so that the training and the learnings are all coming out of our territory and not somewhere else. So I really believe that this project will bring not only um, employment opportunities, but training, education, and secure revenue for years to come. I think it's quite amazing when you think about what we can get into with the heat rights. The heat rights are going to be a huge, huge, huge play in all of this. Um, you know, when you go to the grocery store in Fort Nelson, you're not always getting the freshest produce. Um, you pretty much have to go to the grocery store every day and, and know that you need that produce and you're going to be using it in the next couple of days. It would be very fascinating for me to like be able to um, grow that food for our community, um, by our community, and also provide that food up into the North and Northwest Territories and the Yukon where it can be very challenging, um, you know, and it will just all be uh, like a hub in the North. So when I think of this geothermal project, I'm a visionary. I always think about a hundred years ahead. Um, I always think about future generations and what we're leaving behind because I know we're doing good now, but we have to ensure that anything we get involved in sustains them. So I can see like things like smart cities coming here where we're really reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. We're powering the north, you know, maybe an opportunity to power Alberta. Meanwhile, powering Fort Nelson area 
with this new um, renewable energy project and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. In the past, um, you know, as you mentioned in my bio that I worked at the Fort Nelson gas plant for the last 20 years. And um, many British Columbians may not know this, but, you know, through the gas plant, they were one of the highest taxpayers because of um, being one of the, the biggest polluters in BC. So we're trying to change that here. Um, we're trying to um, ensure that anything we get into, we can um, utilize this heat that's coming from the earth. So if there is um, you know, another boom and bust for LNG, that uh, we have an opportunity to provide power to that industry through um, clean power, um, reduce the diesel in the air, um, same thing for NWT and the Yukon. A lot of nations are running off of um, diesel generation and, and other fuels that aren't very friendly with the environment. But uh, I just, I'm just so thankful for everyone that has supported us, whether it was the First Nation Major Projects Coalition, um, the federal government, the provincial government, um, you know, uh, Geoscience BC, um, the oil and gas, because even though people don't think that they were involved in making this project a reality, they really were, because um, we were able to just save a lot of money by oil and gas activity happening in the area, and then the money that uh, the geoscience um, group uh, uh, received to do some more feasibility studies. You know, I think this project has really opened up a lot of people's eyes. Um, you know, oil and gas is something that is near and dear to our heart, and it isn't going away. Oil and gas is something that we need as an Indigenous nation, and, you know, so do um, many people across Canada and, and around the world. But uh, it just gives us an opportunity to be able to explore those projects and to actually build them with the best environmental standards that we can put in place so that we all can be successful and, and have a clean earth to live on. Excellent. And the the Clark Lake Geothermal Project, it's not um, it's quite sophisticated and it's quite complex. Right. And um, and I'm wondering, you know, the work of the major projects coalition, the um, the coalition itself um, is established in part to promote the shared interests of their members who span across Canada through the uh, advancing the capacity of members in economic participation and environmental stewardship opportunities. How instrumental was the Major Projects Coalition? Uh, how, were, how instrumental were they in having this uh, geothermal project come to fruition? And what was some of the real services that they provided to your community that uh, kind of pushed you over the top to be able to get the investments that you have in the project now? So with the First Nation Major Projects Coalition, they were really able to help us get to the right tables and um, facilitate meetings with government and other um, people that have expertise in, in the field. I have to say that, um, you know, without them, we would have had more challenges. They brought a lot of solutions to the table so that the board of directors could make really good informed decisions. And we're very thankful for their assistance. They continue to help us and they continue to support us on this project. So we're very, very thankful for that. Um, you know, I just think about the Major Projects Coalition and, and what they're doing to create awareness about um, ensuring that Indigenous values are incorporated in ESG. And I think you're going to see a lot of um, Indigenous communities come equity ownerships and other projects where they have co partners or maybe they're sole proponents and, um, you know, own the whole project um, for, the, for the nation self. Um, I think that when you have equity into these projects that there's higher investors confidence and smoother regulatory processes, but it's also um, gives a way for the nation to ensure that their values and um, their, their thoughts are involved in the environmental standards that happen with the project. And ultimately it gives the, um, the proponent or, or whatnot um, the social license to operate in that territory, which sometimes I don't think that um, big corporations really understand what a social license is and, and how they could work to the benefit of the people and not just about profits. So most Indigenous people I know are in favor of 
of uh, industry. Um, not everyone feels the same, but most of us are in favor. And when, especially when it's the benefit um, to our community and it's done responsibility, uh, responsibly, but I think we need to empower more Indigenous nations to become full partners in the developments that are ha happening in our territories. Um, the coalition has really opened up my eyes as a leader in the last five years. I started um, as an observer watching the process. And what I really liked about the coalition is the roundtables that bring the members together to really move the work quarterly. I found that the most um, productive way to ensure that what we are saying is actually being implemented and they're helping us find the support and the capacity to make informed decisions, fully understand the risks and benefits that a project can bring and share information with our members and our neighbors and the municipality of how um, a project can benefit not only our people through um, you know, employment and training and, and ownership, but how it can benefit the local municipality in the region. Um, everyone has a piece to put into the pie, whether you're a small business owner, whether you're um, indigenous um, group or organization working towards um, the betterment of, of your community. Um, I feel that uh, this capacity has allowed us to move forward and understand projects at a high level, especially um, advocating for what is needed for policy changes, um, whether that's the Indian Act, whether that's for UNDRIP or um, old policies that just don't work for us. And um, when we do that, I think that we'll have, we'll be more effective. Um, I think that um, when nations have this information, they can thoroughly, thoroughly conduct their own assessments of projects and avoid any uh, unlegal, um, avoid any um, legal unrest. Um, I have been in those situations. They're not fun situations. Um, nothing is more frustrating than sitting with a company trying to work out how we can move forward, how we can help them be successful, only to feel like you're wasting your time for, for um, just wasting your time. I mean, I think that um, the more we can come together and uh, work out what needs to happen on the land, because that's where the decisions are made for us as Dene and Cree people is out on the land. Um, the more we all be successful just by working together and, and talking about your, your plans day one and how that fits into how we see the project being laid out on our territory. Yeah, and I've, and like I said um, earlier, Chief, I have a really interesting vantage point because I'm the facilitator, right? And I get to stand in front of the room and, and um, lead people through the major project coalition's agenda. And, and, and I, I must say, um, um, you're masterful in terms of how you're able to focus on the economy, but also pay attention to the environment, right? And I think through watching you, it, it, it's not the economy versus the environment, it's the economy and the environment, right? And I think that we can participate in the economy in ways that align with who we are as people, as well as uh, protecting the environment that all of us, uh, regardless of our cultural background, we all rely upon um, the environment to sustain us. And, you know, um, poverty in my work, um, poverty has become normalized in far too many of our families. Like it's just normal to grow up in poverty. It's normal to be on social assistance. And, you know, my, uh, my perspective has always been that that's not normal at all, that our people were always prosperous um, on the territory. And um, I believe very strongly that we're going to lose our, our language and culture faster in poverty than we will in prosperity. So economic participation, I believe, is central to not only providing happy, healthy and whole families, but also promoting um, our culture, practicing our culture, protecting our culture um, out on, uh, on the territory. Um, you have a, a small boy, don't you? What's your boy's name? Hunter. Hunter, I was going to say Colt. Um, Hunter, uh, talk to me a little bit about Hunter. Like, why do you do this work? Like, um, I know how much you love your boy, uh, you and your husband. And why do you do this, uh, this work, Charlene? 
So one of the main reasons why I do this work is because I believe in my people. I believe in my community and I believe in what the elders are telling me. Um, you know, sometimes being in a leadership role like this isn't easy. Um, you face a lot of challenges and um, sometimes there's a lot of hatred towards you because people don't understand or don't want to take the, the time to understand. Um, I think it's important as a leader to um, really lift up your people. We've been here for thousands of years. You know, we have um, so many things to celebrate. We've overcome so many challenges with, uh, <laughs> since we signed the treaty, um, since the newcomers have come. I think that it's so important for our people to stand up for our rights to ensure that um, the treaty is being honored and that we can live away our way of life that honors our ancestors. Um, I want to ensure that future generations have an opportunity as we have now to move forward and to just be acknowledged and, and to be remembered. Um, and um, I just, I think it's just, um, it's a lot of work. And I think that the more our people show up, the more we can do, um, the more we create awareness on our issues and try to find solutions, the more that we can bring prosperity to everybody. Um, as I said earlier, you know, we have a lot of treaty promises that haven't been um, honored, but we're working towards that in a very productive way. Um, I do the work that I do for my people is because we have always had good leaders making good decisions by listening to our people and guiding the way. Um, I think about uh, how, how thankful I am for their leadership in ensuring that our rights were protected. Fort Nelson First Nation has a lot to be thankful for. And sometimes, you know, when we get into deep discussions and debate as community members, I have to remind our members that we're very fortunate. Some nations don't have what we have. And, you know, that's why I do the work that we do is because <clears throat> I've traveled to a lot of First Nation communities and I've seen the challenges. I've seen the overcrowding in the houses. I have seen councils and leaders, um, you know, get uh, upset, uh, depressed, um, you know, because they're not able to provide for their communities like they would like to because of the oppression, because of um, the way things have happened for their nations and not having those opportunities that were going and happening around them. I see that changing slowly as Canadians, um, as the Canadian government opens up this conversation to UNDRIP and, you know, the truth and reconciliation, um, you know, actions that, that need to happen among other, um, you know, other topics in that regard, if it's murdered and missing women, there's a lot of work to do. So I do this because I want those nations to have what we have. We have been so fortunate to have leadership really stand up to industry and to ensure that we're managing our lands and resources. And I want that for other communities so that if they want to invest in their, their youth and their members in education, that they will have that money through own source revenue to be able to do that. If they want to focus on health and wellness and um, you know, ensure that the people are getting the healing and the traditional services that they need, they're able to do that. So ultimately, at the end of the day, like I said, I've traveled to many communities, I've seen the despair, I've seen the hurt, I've seen the pain, I carry it as an Indigenous woman myself. Um, you know, life, life isn't always easy, but we need to remember um, that we have a lot to be proud of. We have a lot of successes to um, share. And when somebody is successful, whether you're Indigenous or non-Indigenous, we just need to lift the people up and start working together and fulfilling these promises.
Yeah, and, and you know that reconciliation requires all of us, right, Chief? It just it can't fall on on um, the shoulders of uh, one of two, one or two groups. It requires all Canadians working together. And if there was one thing um, that you wish every Canadian knew that would make the road to reconciliation a better one, what would that one thing be, Chief? I think that we need to understand how our country was built. Um, I think that it's important that people understand that we have been here for thousands of years. And if it wasn't for us, then the newcomers and settlers may have not survived some of the difficult terrains and um, challenges that they faced when they were trying to um, take care of their families. Um, you know, I think about uh, my people and what had happened when the newcomers had come. You know, the Alaska Highway was built in such a short period of time, and it was the first time that a lot of our people seen others from, from other countries and so forth. And, you know, we greeted them with open arms and we looked after them. Um, you know, we provided substance to them, medicines and foods, and we even helped them lead the way in revolutionizing the North and getting to where they needed to go through our Indian trails. So I think that can't be forgotten because there's so many Indigenous nations and communities that have done that. And those stories aren't the ones that are told. Mm -hmm. I think that we need to have a better understanding about who, who you are, what does it mean to be Canadian? What does it mean to honor where you are living in the territory of a First Nation? And really taking um, a step forward to get to know. Um, you know, we all have uh, Indigenous people and, and friends in our lives. Just have that conversation with them and be open to listening and just be opening to maybe having a change of heart of how you view us as Indigenous people. Mm -hmm. Do your homework. Mm -hmm. Have a heart, I guess, essentially is, is a part of your message here. And I'm, I want to throw you a little bit of a curveball, okay? Something out, outside there. Like, imagine you're hosting the dinner party of your dreams. And uh, you can invite three people, dead or alive, fictional or real. Mm -hmm. you invite, and what are you making for dinner out of your big garden you have, Chief? Well, first off, I would, uh, would love to meet some of my ancestors. Um, you hear stories about them all the time and you wonder what their life would be like. Um, you know, and we do so many things as indigenous leaders, indigenous people to honor them. But uh, what would I make? I would definitely make a traditional meal. Um, I love uh, hunting and fishing. So one of my favorite uh, meals is bone marrow. So moose bone marrow. And, you know, I like the beaver tail. And so these are more like traditional fatty foods, what are, which I think are very important to the Dene and Cree diet. Um, you know, I would just uh, really open up my freezer and just show them that, you know, I do have like the raspberries and the blueberries and the silk berries that we pick off the land. And, you know, I could dig in my freezer right here because I am sitting in my kitchen and pull out some frozen dandelions and spruce buds and those things that I think are important to our health. Um, I just think it would be amazing to sit here with my grandmother that uh, passed when I was four years old and I didn't get to, to know her well. Um, that would be an honor. Yeah, that would be an honor. Excellent. Thank you very much, Chief. And Thank you for the clarification too, because when you said traditional meal, I went right to Kentucky Fried Chicken and Chinese, <laughs> and then you brought me back to bone marrow and beaver tail, right? Yeah, absolutely. My, so, uh, my lips here, <laughs> Chief. Um, I love you, and I've learned um, a lot about leadership over the years, and um, I've watched you, and you have been one of my teachers. Um, in your service to others, I have noticed the following six things that I, that I see about you. Uh, to you, leadership is not about controlling people. It's about caring for people and being a useful resource for people. Uh, to you, leadership is not about being the boss either. Um, it's about being present for people and building uh, a community um, of like-minded individuals. 
Uh, I've noted that leadership uh, for you is about letting go of your ego and bringing your spirit to work, being your best and most authentic self at, at all times. Um, I've watched you be less concerned with pep talks and more concerned with creating a place in which people can do those things that, uh, that they need to do for good work. They can find meaning in their work and they can bring their spirits to work as well. And uh, leadership like life, uh, Chief, is uh, largely a matter of paying attention. And leadership requires love. And um, your love for the people, um, for your people up in uh, the Fort Nelson First Nation, um, your love uh, for all people um, across British Columbia, um, Canada, Turtle Island, is evident um, in the conduct of your work, Chief. So um, when, when I watch you lean into your leadership responsibilities, I am reminded that true power comes from the people. It comes from gaining the trust and support of the people who then give you the power. And power is like love. Uh, the more you try to give it to others, the more it just seems to flow to you naturally. So thank you, um, Chief Gale, for spending time with us today. We know that there are many pressing demands in your time and you've chosen to be with us uh, today. And for that, we are uh, grateful. And uh, to my audience out there, uh, please join me in future episodes of Reconciliation Road where I will introduce more exciting change agents like Chief Charlene Gale, who are pushing the dial on reconciliation. Uh, until then, uh, stay safe and keep standing in the light. Masi Cho. Masi Cho, hi hi. Reconciliation Road is supported by the First Nations Major Projects Coalition. The FNMPC is a nonprofit organization dedicated to providing free of charge resources to First Nations in Canada, supporting their efforts to gain equity ownership stakes in major projects being developed on their traditional territories, while ensuring that the integrity of the land is maintained for the enjoyment of current and future generations. The FNMPC envisions a future where we walk the path of the Reconciliation Road together. For more information, please visit us at fnmpc.ca. Thank you.